Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another round of webinars brought to you by the Lighting Design Lab. This morning's topic, Commercial Refrigeration Part 1, will be accompanied by Part 2 on Thursday. It's 10 o'clock now. We are going to wait about three minutes to allow people to have a chance to settle themselves in, and we will jump back at about 10.03 and get going with the broadcast. Thank you for being with us. All right, once again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for the latest in the Lighting Design Lab educational webinar series. This morning, we are lucky enough to have a great presenter who is going to be talking to us about commercial refrigeration. This, of course, is part one of this class. Part two will be on Thursday, same time, uh, same place. So to get going, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, during the class, uh, as always, everyone is going to be muted. I think we're all used to this by now, but it's unfortunately really not possible to keep these things going uh, without uh, doing that much as we'd like to have a lively discussion. When you do have questions, please go ahead and enter them in the questions feature. You'll notice on your GoToWebinar interface bar, there will be a, uh, a carrot that says questions. Use that, open that up. Uh, go ahead and send that, and um, questions will either be addressed uh, as they come in, depending on the type of question, or they may be uh, held in advance for a brief time until the uh, instructor has a chance to uh, answer them in the flow of the, of the uh, class. There will likely be several uh, online polls. Please participate in those. Those help to keep things moving forward. And there will also be a short survey after the class. We use that at the Lighting Design Lab to really keep an eye on what it is that you, the participants, would like to see in our classes. So please go ahead and uh, fill that out. And in particular, go ahead and fill out any kinds of additional educational opportunities that you would like to see. As always, a recording and the slide deck for this uh, presentation will be posted on the Lighting Design Lab webpage. It'll take about a week to get that up there. And go ahead and reach out with any um, questions or comments to either lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov or um, I will give you my email, shondara at seattle.gov at, uh, at the end of the broadcast. Of course, we are the Lighting Design Lab, and we are powered by and part of Seattle City Light, uh, your favorite electric utility and mine. Now, as always, uh, many of you, well, many of you are, are, are new to the lab. Uh, we have a 30 plus year history of working with anyone who needs education, needs support, needs training, 
uh, needs uh, additional information. We work with everyone from end user customers to trade allies, design allies, uh, anyone who needs uh, help. We tend to have four service territories, uh, four service areas. Uh, we do a lot of education and training, just like this particular class here. Uh, we tend to evaluate technology. We offer tools and resources, for example, light meters, things like that. And we serve as an information aggregation point. So we go out to a lot of the conferences and seek a lot of information that we can then filter down and provide for uh, all of you. So without further ado, I am going to hand off presentation to Lester. Uh, this morning we will have Lester Terrence and Diane Rasmussen, both from uh, DNR International. Uh, Lester will be uh, giving us the talk. Diane will be moderating for him. Again, please, 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 uh, post your questions in the questions tab. Do it when you think about it. Uh, that way, Diane will have a chance to look at them and uh, uh, determine when and how uh, they need to get answered. So without further ado, Lester, please take it away. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Diane, before we get started, do you want to uh, uh, go ahead first and then I'll, I'll jump into the introduction part? Sure, I just wanted to um, again tell you that you we will be using the questions tab for any questions that you have. I'll be sending some links through the chat. So watch for the Slido link if you need it and any other resources that Lester may re refer to. Um, otherwise, that's pretty much it. It's about two hours long. We'll take a break about halfway through. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Diane. Uh, once again, welcome to uh, Commercial Refrigeration. I will be your instructor today. My name is Lester Terrence. I'll get into a, a quick uh, introduction of myself. Uh, I am an HVAC instructor and instructional designer uh, over at DNR International. I've been there for roughly a year. Uh, prior to uh, joining up with DNR International, I served uh, roughly seven to eight years with the Department of State as an HVAC field supervisor and subject matter expert. And prior to that, uh, I served uh, 12 years with the United States Air Force as uh, an HVAC airman. <clears throat> so I started my career with the United States Air Force and then uh, worked my way to the State Department where I got the opportunity to work overseas on several different HVAC applications um, for different embassies, consulates, and U.S. military installations. I, uh, I am a licensed master HVAC in the Virginia area, and I've been in the trade for roughly uh, about 19 years or so. Uh, I do enjoy it very much, and I actually enjoy uh, what I do now, which is uh, creating HVAC material and instructing it as well. Today we'll be utilizing Slido.com. Um, it is the application which we use to uh, provide you uh, our activity sessions where you can go and answer questions uh, to any of the case studies or videos you may uh, observe in this presentation today. <clears throat> now Slido is free, uh, does not store your personal information. Uh, and it's like I said earlier, it's just used to create interactive questions and answer sessions within our presentation. So we definitely want to hear from you. Um, we want you to participate in uh, our presentation on refrigeration, commercial refrigeration today. So in order to do that, we'd like for you to go to slido.com and you will enter the event code REFER -E or REFER, R-E-F-E-R. -E uh, and what that will do is it will allow you to uh, uh, take a part in our question and answer portion of any activity sessions we have uh, going on today. So to test out uh, slido.com, make sure it's working and operational for uh, everyone that is uh, in our presentation today, our attendees. What we'd like to do is get to know you a little bit better. Um, and this will also give you an opportunity to head on over to slido.com and 
uh, enter that code so that way you can make sure it's working for you and let us know in the chat or questions area if you're having any issues. So uh, right now we'll actually jump into our first activity, which is uh, answering a few questions about yourself and your experience in the industry. And we will utilize uh, our Slido poll to do so. So if you are capable of um, utilizing QR technology on your cell phone, in the top left-hand corner of your screen right now, you should see a QR code which you can slide, uh, not slide, but uh, you can scan, which would take you straight to slido.com uh, where you can start working on the introduction survey. Or you can utilize your web browser and go directly to slido.com and enter the keyword Refer, R E F E R, which will allow you to take part in the survey. I'll give everyone a few minutes to uh, jump in on the survey on slido.com. Uh, it will take about three minutes to do that, and we will come back and review some of our answers. Once again, you can scan the QR code at the top left-hand corner of the screen, and it should uh, take you over to slido.com uh, where you can take part in that first survey. Terrence, there doesn't appear to be any active poll at the moment. I think you need to engage one. I'm on the Slido site now. Yeah, I am just now uh, looking into that. I think we have an issue with Slido. Give me one second here. Let me double check that. Can I have to give me one second? I think we need to restart the uh, the presentation for Google Slides, which should reset everything. There you go. Parents, are you sharing your screen? Yes, I'm here. I, I had to minimize the screen so I can restart the uh, the Google Slideshow. I think uh, there's an issue with Slido. Uh, it may be because I had the slide open for a while prior to us uh, getting ready to start it. Okay, apologies for the delay, folks. All right, let's try this one more time. So we do have some individuals in the, uh, okay, so it's working now, there we go. So we needed a uh, restart, I do apologize about that. Uh, sometimes we have some small issues with Slido. Um, 
but uh, we've been able to get it back on track. So please go ahead and uh, take some time now to answer the introductory survey uh, questions, and we'll review that in another two minutes or so. So let's give everyone some time to get into the uh, slido.com active poll. Uh, once again, you can sc scan the QR code top left-hand corner or go directly to slido.com. And it seems like uh, for the most part, we're getting some uh, individuals in there. So let's take some time now to answer those questions and we'll be right back to review those. We currently have 16 participants in the class. Thank you, Diane. Looks like we've got a bit over half of the class uh, completed with that. We'll give it about another minute here and we'll start going over our introductory survey. <clears throat> so our first question on our survey is, do you practice a trade such as uh, being an electrician, an HVAC technician, or a plumber? And it looks like 92% uh, of our class is right at about, uh, is not, not practicing a trade, but we do have 8%. <laughs> Uh, who is uh, in the trades and practicing. So if uh, those individuals that are in the trade could maybe write into the chat area or question area what uh, specific uh, tradesperson or trade they're, they're working as. Curious to find out. How many years are combined, of combined education and experience do you have in refrigeration? And it seems like a good bit of our class has less than a year <clears throat> of refrigeration experience, one to two years at 25%, and three to four years at 8%. So we have a, uh, a vast uh, amount of experience uh, within the class and non-experience. So we'll, what we'll do is we will, uh, we will, uh, we will try to gauge the the way we present this class today. Um, so that way for the majority of the class that does not have a great deal of experience in uh, our AC uh, uh, refrigeration cycle or anything that we're going through in our commercial refrigeration course today, um, that we uh, address them specifically so that way those individuals that have less experience can uh, get a better understanding. Uh, what is your current understanding of refrigeration? I am new and ready to learn. That's awesome. Uh, we have a great course today that uh, we will go through for you to uh, pick up a lot of information you may not have known, or it can be great review for those of us that uh, are experienced in refrigeration. So we have some individuals that are ready to learn over half the course and over, a little bit under half have dabbled in uh, refrigeration and the topic. So uh, it's great having everyone here. And uh, we will definitely uh, have a good course load to cover uh, for commercial refrigeration. So our learning objectives uh, will consist of three parts. And the first part will be to examine the refrigeration history and also the cold chain process. 
Uh, we'll also identify refrigeration equipment. And lastly, examine the refrigeration process and also the controls. So let's go ahead and jump straight into our presentation today. Uh, and uh, we will be starting off with our first part of our agenda, which is the history, cold chain, and also uh, farm to table process. Um, and before we do that, what we wanna do is we want to discuss a little bit why uh, are we talking about refrigeration? Why is the topic so um, important? What's important to know about refrigeration? And what kinds of applications do we utilize refrigeration in? Now, there are several industries which requires the use of refrigeration ranging from the medical industry to the produce and restaurant industries. We will cover some of these applications in these industries, but we'll maintain a focus on the storage of food. Refrigeration is a vital part of modern food production. And without a means to cool and keep food cold, the quality and safety of food would be compromised and the sophisticated cold chain we are used to would not be possible. We'll talk to cold chain process a little bit more in depth uh, in this section of uh, our presentation. So let's define some of the terms which occurs uh, prior to jumping into uh, uh, much more technical information in our presentation. Let's talk about uh, uh, what occurs when we have food, food spoilages. Uh, and in the context of food, spoilage is the deterioration of food and perishable goods. Now, spoilage occurs when you have some of these different uh, activities that are happening within our, our food products. Uh, these are some of the different conditions that can occur um with your food if it doesn't have <clears throat> excuse me if it doesn't have proper refrigeration so one of the first things from left to right that you will have occurring uh is spoilage bacteria my, my, uh, micro microorganisms spoilage bacteria uh, are created from microorganisms which are too small to be seen uh, without a microscope and it causes food to deteriorate and develop an unpleasant odor uh, including taste and also textures. Uh, these one cell microorganisms can cause fruits and vegetables to get mushy or slimy or meat to develop a bad odor. So if you have fruits and vegetables that are becoming mushy and slimy and um, they're not looking uh, as crisp as they were when you pick them up from the grocery store, it might be time to check in on your refrigerated temperatures to make sure uh, your humidity controls, and also the temperature is, is correct uh, for those different types of produce. Another type of change that you can have uh, that occurs due to spoilage is uh, enzymatic changes. And enzymatic changes occur uh, when you have oxygen in the air, uh, which can cause fruit to brown up, uh, which, is a, which the process of it is called enzymic browning. Uh, an enzyme, an enzymatic browning is an oxidation reaction that takes place in some foods, mostly fruits and vegetables, uh, uh, and this is what causes these fruits, fruits and vegetables to turn brown. Next, you have oxidation, and uh, oxidation is a chemical process that produces undesir undesirable changes uh, in color and nutrient content. And this results when air reacts with food components, similar to the, an enzymatic change. When the fats in foods uh, become stale or foul, oxidation is the responsible party for that, uh, that issue. Uh, next, you have surface dehydration, which is food dehydration, um, a process of reducing the moisture uh, of food levels to low levels. Um, and uh, food dehydration is one of the oldest processes in the food industry. Uh, refrigeration, refrigerators are very good at removing humidity, and therefore uh, there are certain produce which we should store in our refrigeration in our refrigerators, such as fats and oils. Uh, not only can fat and oil inhibit efficient drying, 
uh, they can also create a problem uh, with that, that foul smelling or that taste, that unpleasant taste, uh, especially after they've been heated. Uh, avocados is something else um, that we shouldn't store in our, refrigera in our refrigerators. Uh, long term is the solution like a, a freezer. Uh, I freeze a lot of my avocados when I buy a lot of them. Um, the fat content in avocados is, is just too high for your refrigerator. So you may want to, if you want to long term, uh, think, of, uh, think about long term storage for uh, products such as avocados, you want to look into freezing those. Food stored unsealed in refrigerators uh, also will become dehydrated. And you, you also have uh, down below surface dehydration, you have wilting. Um, and uh, this is where your, your vegetables lose their, their crispness over time. So they're not as crisp when you, you first buy those, uh, those fruits, those, those vegetables. Vegetables have specific optimum refrigeration temperatures or need that and require them to maintain their shelf life. And um, those different types of uh, uh, temperatures vary from uh, uh, vegetable to vegetable. And there are two more that are not on screen, but I'll talk about them really quickly, um, which is suffocation. And suffocation is uh, certain vegetables uh, that are packed up um, could uh, be suffocated by that packaging. So that packaging that is around your vegetables when you purchase them from the store uh, need to have some sort of uh, uh, perforated holes in them so that way those vegetables uh, could breathe. And if it doesn't have that, uh, they'll begin to break down. And lastly, we have freezer burn. Um, uh, the process of freezer burn happens when two actions are taking place. Um, and part of that is dehydration. Uh, the when uh, those when those uh, different vegetables or or items that we put in our freezer for future storage uh, begins to go through that dehydration process, uh, the cellular walls of that food product begins becoming frozen, which reduces the quality and also the texture uh, of that food. So here we can see a few different. Um, terms that we utilize with spoilage or uh, the uh, fouling of food products that we utilize every day. And without refrigeration, uh, we wouldn't be able to maintain these products for the length of time that we need to store them for when we're ready to use them. So refrigeration is a very important process to keeping our foods um, available for us at, at fresh rates whenever we need to get to them. And without refrigeration, we could definitely have a problem uh, when dealing with that. So let's talk, before we jump into some of the processes that we can uh, um, link with directly with refrigeration, let's go into a bit about the history of refrigeration. But before we jump into that, do we have any questions on uh, some of the different terms that we've gone over here with spoilage and uh, some of the uh, issues that you may have with your fruits, vegetables, produce, meats uh, when storing them and uh, some of these definitions. No questions in the queue. Okay. So we'll jump into the history of refrigeration. I find this portion uh, of the presentation uh, extremely um, uh, important and, and uh, just because of the way that uh, technology has advanced uh, over the last few years. And from the ancient times through present times, we have tried to preserve food by keeping it cold. And we will discuss here about these different types of uh, earlier processes. Um, and as, uh, as you can see from left to right, uh, from 400 BC all the way up till 1927, uh, we've had a lot of different processes um, as far as the way we refrigerate our foods or um, the, the types of uh, uh, applications we utilize to, to uh, refrigerate our food has evolved uh, a great deal 
over time. So what we'll do here is just go through a short timeline of the refrigeration processes through time. And if we start from 400 BC, uh, we can see that the first uh, use of uh, refrigeration was the use of a conical ice house or also known as a yakel, uh, which dates back to 400 BC. And these were built by the Persians to capture and store ice. Uh, it was often used to store ice, but sometimes it was used as well to store food. Yakels function as an evaporative cooler. So for those of us that are familiar with the uh, process, um, um, these, uh, these temple-like uh, looking structures uh, allows cold air to pour in from entries at the base of the structure and descend to the lowest parts of the yakel, uh, which were pretty large underground spaces up to 180,000 cubic feet in volume. So the process wasn't mechanical of any nature. It was, it was a natural process occurring, um, which allowed that cold air uh, to pour in directly into the base of the yakel. At the same time, the tall conical shape of the, uh, the, the building or the ice house um, guides any of the remaining heat upwards and outside through the openings at the very top of the, uh, of the yakel. And through its active process, the air inside the yakel remains cooler than the outside. These are still used today. And in uh, these, these types of uh, refrigeration processes, this yakel, the conical ice house, is still used today um, in, in a lot of countries. Uh, and you will find them in certain areas of the world, such as Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan. Uh, these are just some of the places that yakels are still uh, being utilized today. The term yakel is also used to refer to modern refrigerators. We move on to the early 1900s, uh, and in the early 1900s, ice was harvested from frozen bodies of water and stored in insulated ice houses. And then it was delivered to homes to be installed inside of the ice box. So you can see in this picture here, you have an individual uh, to the left and they are delivering ice over to a, a, a customer um, that requires it, which that ice now goes into uh, an ice box. And the issue with these, this process back in the early 1900s was that unless the water source was extremely pure, uh, very pure, there was always uh, issues with vegetation, debris, and microbes uh, inside of the, uh, formed inside of the source from the ice as the ice is forming. So once that ice made it to the residential customer or consumer, uh, they would put it in their product or whatever it is they're using it for. And as it melted, uh, you'd have pieces of grit and sand and small plants um, in your beverage or whatever it is that you may be using that ice for. So it wasn't a very uh, uh, sanitary way of creating ice uh, back in the earlier 1900s. And then over to the uh, far right, uh, we can see uh, the GE monitor top, um, which is a more modern form of refrigeration, which was created uh, in the mid 1900s. Uh, around this time, electric, mechanical refrigeration started showing up in homes. The first generation refrigerants used in these devices were ammonia, methyl chloride, or sulfur dioxide, all of which were uh, really uh, a combination of toxic, flammable, or highly reactive refrigerants. Now, current systems today will util utilize R134A, but prior to this, um, it was the use of R12, which is no longer utilized due to its ozone depleting properties. Uh, we uh, understand that R134A is considered a safer alternative uh, to our environment and our changing times and uh, definitely trying to keep the air uh, that we breathe much cleaner. So R12 was a, was a very good refrigerant that was utilized back in the, in, in the times of uh, some of this older technology. And it actually was a very, uh, 
popular refrigerant. It was a good refrigerant, which kept things very, very cold. And uh, we no longer utilize R12. It's no longer being developed uh, because of its ozone depleting properties. So R134A is much of the refrigerant that you will see in uh, a lot of these applications um, for refrigeration today. Now, quick funny reference, uh, I, I found this out uh, while doing research to create these decks. Uh, in 1927, the company marketed uh, a refrigerator, GE marketed a refrigerator with the compressor mounted on the top, which is what you can see here uh, to the far right. You have the 1927 GE monitor top. Uh, the unit itself was not originally called the monitor top. Um, but it quickly gained the name the monitor top because the top mounted refrigeration compressor resembled the turret on uh, an old Civil War ironclad ship named the USS Monitor. So this refrigerator that you see to the very right um, was located in a lot of homes. And uh, back then they thought that it was funny uh, that the compressor, which you can see the round unit sitting on the top of that is the compressor. Um, that uh, looked similar to the turret on, on an old ship. So everyone started calling the uh, calling that refrigerator the monitor top. There's just a little piece of history uh, on the um, some of the more modern refrigerators that uh, started uh, becoming more advanced as, as time went on. Now, from the ancient times through present times, we've tried to preserve food by keeping it cold. Uh, we discussed the use of yakles, insulated ice houses, and, G and the G monitor top, which is more technological advances in the refrigeration process. And since 1775, human beings have been trying to invent ways to reduce temperature mechanically um, and, have, and has had much success. Um, and when you think of applications beyond uh, just the food industry, uh, we look to the left here, J&E Hall uh, was one of the forerunners of modern refrigeration. And as early as 1886, the company designed the first two-stage carbon dioxide compressor. And if we look over to the right, as the design evolved and improved, the equipment was also uh, purpose for community entertainment. So not only was uh, refrigeration uh, created to, to keep our foods uh, longer and, and, and have them stored for a, a greater deal of, of time, uh, we, started cre we started utilizing refrigeration processes for uh, community entertainment. J&E Hall supplied the first uh, refrigeration equipment to the National Skating Palace uh, back in 1910. Um, so we, at, at the time of creating ref, uh, or using the vapor compression cycle or refrigeration processes to um, remove heat uh, from areas where we needed to keep cool for food to become uh, stored, uh, we started thinking further into what more can we use refrigeration processes for. Um, and we started putting it into the uh, uh, community and, and utilizing refrigeration for community entertainment. So uh, when you think about this again, uh, I want you to think refrigeration was not created for what we uh, used it in the initial, what we use it today for, um, which is mostly uh, to cool an area of your home or an office and just get that heat off of you. Or even what we, we, uh, we were doing now with ice skating rinks and such. These, the, the refrigeration process was initially created to just keep our food from becoming perishable. Um, and as the technology uh, got better, we were able to um, start using refrigeration processes for more and more applications. So here are a few more uh, of the earlier large-scale refrigeration applications. Uh, from left to right, we've got Willis Carrier receiving his first U.S. patent for the air conditioning apparatus in 1906. Uh, and then over to the right, uh, my hometown of Brooklyn, New York, the uh, 
air conditioning that you can see in this uh, uh, situation here um, was developed to address quality print problems um, with a printing press due to humidity. And uh, originally, air conditioning was developed to address this issue. So back in New York, Brooklyn, New York in 1902, uh, air conditioning was developed for Sackett and Wilhelm's uh, lithography and printing company, where they had an issue with uh, high humidity inside of their uh, where their print press was located, and they needed to find a, they needed to find a way to reduce that. So air conditioning was developed to satisfy that issue. And over to the right, uh, you can see that uh, Carrier's first installation of the system for comfort cooling. Uh, was installed and uh, was installed and developed at the Rivoli Theater in 1925. So we didn't have comfort cooling, meaning cooling for uh, the human being, uh, up until 1925. This is when uh, comfort cooling is born. This is where uh, we first started seeing the introduction of systems that uh, were responsible for uh, overall keeping facilities. Uh, or homes cool. Now, before I move on to the cold chain and uh, farm to table process, do we have any questions on the history of uh, refrigeration before we move forward? Nothing in the queue. All right, so let's uh, let's keep this going. Um, like Diane said, well, we do have a break halfway through. So uh, in about 18 minutes or so, we'll go ahead and take a, a quick break and then we'll come back to it. But before we do that, let's talk a bit about the cold chain and farm to the table process. So when we talk to the cold chain or farm to table process, we'll break both of those down and we'll start with cold chain. We speak to cold chain. Cold chain refers to managing the temperature of perishable products in order to maintain quality and safety from the point of origin through the distribution chain to the final customer. So there's an entire process, which we'll go through here um, in the next few slides, on how that process occurs, which is a very in-depth process. Um, and for those of us that are not familiar with it, I think uh, you'll be well informed today on exactly how that process in the cold chain um, uh, world works. And then you have your farm to table uh, uh, process, which farm to, to table dining is just a quippy way of explaining to diners that restaurants prioritize exactly where their food is grown, often sourcing directly from farms rather than through a major distribution company. So it's a major difference between your cold chain process and your farm to table process, but it's 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 a very uh, straightforward uh, approach. So your farm to table process, um, there is no major uh, uh, distribution network involved in a farm to table process. Farm to table means basically your food comes straight from uh, a farmer's market uh, where a farmer delivers that food there. Uh, or directly from that farmer's farm where they do have refrigeration applications to keep that uh, food uh, at temperatures that will not allow it to perish. And then your cold chain process is just more in depth uh, and there's a lot of steps involved in order to get that food from the uh, farm, from the farm all the way to its final destination, whether that be uh, at the restaurant, the supermarket where you're shopping, um, uh, or uh, wherever else we require those goods and, and products. So let's start uh, off with talking about the cold chain process and, and why it's important. And cold, cold chain technology is used for medical and surgical needs, pharmaceutical transportation, and most notably food transportation. Now, in this scenario that we're looking at here, we're gonna follow a bell pepper from the field where it's grown to your home refrigerator. 
bell peppers must be maintained at a temperature of 40 to 45 degrees through the cold chain process. So once again, uh, a bell pepper has to maintain a temperature of 40 to 45 degrees whilst it's moving through the cold chain process. Many foods today, uh, like bell peppers, are harvested before they're completely ripe so that they are still fresh when they reach your table. Once it's harvested and, and it's crated, the bell, pep the bell pepper is loaded onto its first truck. So you can see here, uh, we've got a bell pepper. Sometimes they're ripe, sometimes they're picked. A lot of the times they're picked before they're ripe. Uh, depending on actually the process as well. But in cold chain process, uh, you'll find that bell peppers are probably picked a, a great deal of time before they're ripe. Uh, and they're harvested and placed onto a truck. Let me see if I can get my, there we go. So we've got the bell pepper here. We're gonna harvest that bell pepper uh, on the farm. So the farmers are harvesting that bell pepper and your cold chain um, process starts. That bell pepper is put in crates and it's loaded onto uh, a semi-trailer here, which takes that those crates of bell peppers over to a consolidation uh, center. And this is typically where the transportation cold, cold chain starts. Uh, once it's loaded and, and put on the truck, it is then taken to the consolidation center where it'll be sorted out and either packaged or bulked, uh, boxed in bulk. Now, uh, before we, we move on to the rest of this process, just wanna talk about uh, what goes on sometimes in these consolidation centers, um, because I think it's important for us to, to uh, just touch on this. Uh, tons of produce are discarded yearly for the smallest of blemishes noticeable during the packaging process at these distribution or consolidation centers. Um, it's estimated that approximately 20% of produce or more gets thrown out for cosmetic reasons, such as it, it might have a weird shape uh, or odd colors or blemishes. And when that happens, uh, there's a lot of food that goes to waste. Now, you can help with this waste by purchasing what's called ugly produce. And sites like Imperfect Produce and Hungry Harvest sells these wasted, pretty much still good to eat produce at a discount. And a lot of them even deliver to your door, depending on whether or not this service is available in your area. Um, the services are available in a few cities. Uh, so you want to double check, I'll, I'll, uh, Diane, I think the, uh, the websites are listed in the notes um, for Imperfect Foods and Hungry Harvest. If we could put those in the chat for those individuals that may be uh, interested in um, going to those and supporting those, uh, uh, those different websites that uh, definitely look into reducing the waste of produce that we have out there. So uh, like I said earlier, it's estimated that approximately 20% uh, of produce or more gets thrown out for any of these cosmetic reasons and it starts at our consolidation center. Um, so once we get through at our consolidation center, uh, we go from crating the, uh, the uh, bell pepper over to uh, packaging that bell pepper and uh, labeling it, uh, maybe uh, putting some um, uh, health information on it, uh, whatever the case is that happens at the consolidation center with these products, um, depending on the type of product it is, however they wanna market it or they feel it's best uh, to protect it, uh, happens at these consolidation centers. Once that uh, bell pepper is packaged up nicely, uh, ready for display and purchase at uh, wherever its final destination is, it's put back on a refrigerated uh, truck where it now goes back out to a distribution center. Now the distribution center uh, that the bell pepper will be uh, brought to on a second truck um, this distribution center at, at these at these sites, uh, specific stores are then selected for uh, uh, distribution of that pepper too. 
So um, depending on where the orders are going out to at that point, once it's all packaged up, it gets to the distribution center. And from the distribution center, it goes out to your local um, uh, grocery stores, supermarkets, and such. Now, once that bell pepper has a, a destination store, um, once again, it's loaded back onto the truck uh, to be taken to the docks of that store. And at the store, our bell pepper may be stored for a few days in cold storage before it's brought to the floor for display. It's last and final trip uh, that we can probably be sure of from this point uh, is going to be to enter uh, your car, your 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 own uh, home, or it's going to a delivery truck to be used for some sort of um, uh, commercial kitchen or or a restaurant. Now, from farm to store, that bell pepper is kept at 45 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent overripening. So, from the start, uh, from the harvest point of that bell pepper, we were able to get that bell pepper all the way through the process of uh, distribution centers um, and also the, the actual travel portion on these different um, refrigerated uh, semi, semi trucks, uh, the bell pepper is able to maintain and keep uh, a temperature at 45 degrees to prevent overripening. And this process works. Um, if it didn't, we wouldn't have uh, all the really crisp, nice clean vegetables that we see uh, at our grocery stores every day. So it's a process that's happening every day. Um, goods are being delivered through these commercial um, um, refrigerated vehicles and also once it gets to its destination, even if it's it has to sit for a while, it's still being refrigerated. Now, our farm to table process, we kind of dived into that a little bit, um, but what is uh, what is the definition of farm to table? Uh, and when we talk farm to table process, we're looking at meat, produce, and dairy delivered directly from the farm to the restaurant or even uh, directly to your home. So farm to table is a little less complicated. Um, and considered more of a fresh experience in the quality of the goods that you receive. Uh, so a lot of people may opt in for that, uh, that farm to table experience. Farmers may have a small store and sell directly to consumers. Um, you, may, you, you might see that a lot today uh, in some of our communities where farmers uh, start, started taking all their, their products and going out into the community and selling those um, instead of selling it to a, uh, a, a some sort of distribution center or directly to a supermarket. You can see small pop-ups happening um, around the nation. Uh, farmers may truck their products to a, a farmer's market and then sell direct to consumers. So I see that uh, where I'm from here in Maryland, uh, there's a lot of farmer's markets. And what happens is the farmers just, they come into these markets with all their products uh, and they set them up so that way you can get them uh, directly fresh from their, um, their their farm. There's no packaging packaging uh, for the most part involved in this type of um, um, this type of process. So it's a lot of fresh fruits, vegetables, and meats, um, and they typically come uh, the way that um, they are at the farm, uh, the way they've been uh, harvested at the farm. Uh, products can be anything uh, that is edible from produce to hops, grains delivered directly uh, to a microbrewery. So uh, the farm to table process, um, it, it, it's like I said earlier, it's just a quippy way of addressing the, uh, not addressing, but, but not utilizing the cold chain process. Um, so you're, you're, Foods and produce are not going through several different stops, trucks, and destinations. Um, it may only be one or two stops uh, for it to get to where it, it's going so that way you can pick it up 
And uh, for that reason, that matters to a lot of uh, individuals and businesses alike. Now we do have a uh, read and discuss um, here, uh, which in involves uh, Slido.com. Uh, but before we jump into that, just want to check Diane and see if we have any questions uh, at this time. No questions. All right. We have a link here, Diane. If we can paste that uh, in the chat. Um, we have a read and discuss. It's a short article um, about uh, the farm to table process. And um, it takes a, a bit of a deeper dive into the farm to table process so that way we, um, we can have a better understanding of it. So if we can take a moment here to uh, take a look at this article um, from the link that Diane is going to post, and there'll be some questions to follow uh, on slido.com uh, for our poll uh, that will uh, talk to the pros and cons of cold chain trans uh, uh, pros and cons of, of farm to table um, options that we have available out there so we'll take a look at the article and then answer some of the uh answer the questions directly in the survey so what we'll do here is uh we'll take a look at this article um and we will uh take a look at the article and we will come back and uh, go over the uh, two questions that are uh, assigned to this specific article. Once we get through with that, we'll take a short break and uh, then we will return um, to go uh, further into our presentation today. So take a moment here and uh, take a look at that link. I've got the uh, active poll up for those of you that uh, are, are get done sooner than others. You can get started on that active poll. But what we'll do here is we'll take about uh, about a good six to seven minutes to complete this activity uh, from reading to answering the questions. And then from there, we'll take a short break. So uh, let's take some time here, about five to seven minutes. Let's read the article and then uh, attend to the Slido and we will break right after that.
So we'll give it another uh, two minutes or so uh, for the activity session on Slido. Um, we are reading the, uh, the article on uh, farm to table process. And uh, for those of us that uh, may have joined late, uh, up in the top left-hand corner of the screen, there's a QR code, which you can scan. It'll take you directly to slido.com where you can answer some of our questions for the activity sessions. Or you can join us at slido.com where you enter the keyword reefer, uh, and that will allow you to take uh, part in that as well. I see we still got some uh, some individuals still hopping into the survey, so I'm going to uh, hold off a little bit until we have um, some more people in there. I I know some more of uh, us are still reading or, or working on it, so give it another uh, few minutes here, and we'll we'll jump into our responses here shortly. We have 21 attendees right now. Thank you, Diane. I think we still got some more people coming in, but uh, for time uh, constraint purposes, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead. We have a bit over half the class, uh, which has answered um, the active poll. So let's take a look at some of the questions from the reading that uh, we were assigned here. So our first uh, uh, question here is: What are some pros to the farm to table process? And uh, some of the answers that we can see here on the screen are fresher foods, less food miles, uh, which is a really good uh, point, boosted economy, uh, knowing where your food comes from, 
also most of the cases cutting down carbon footprint in the process of delivering food. Uh, exactly. Uh, local economy boost, lower carbon footprint. I'm seeing that as uh, um, something that's coming up. Um, most people want to see that lower carbon footprint, especially when it comes to your food. Fresh food that supports your local economy and farmers, options for organic foods as well. Um, a lot of the pr uh, uh, processing uh, of food does include that actual processing where uh, it's, it's, um, it's pumped with a lot of the different sodiums in order to keep that food lasting longer. Um, but if you get your, your, your produce directly from uh, a farmer's market or a farm, you know, you have a lot of that, that organic food. It's not treated. It's nothing is done to it. Uh, and you can, you can pick it up and take it home and prepare it really fresh. Uh, more fresh, ripe ingredients that have better flavor, nutrients, supporting local economy rather than uh, faceless, huge mega farms. Absolutely. Uh, harvesting produce uh, uh, when it's ripe, reducing food travel, time distance, boosting the local economy, building relationships uh, between farmers and restaurants for guaranteed business and crop requests. Uh, great seasonally sourced food and helps the economy, uh, helps boost local economy. That is a big factor there. Um, fast, do not need uh, as many steps as the cold chain process creates local market. Uh, that's a really good answer there, um, that it is fast. And, and that cold chain process, or uh, that, yeah, that cold chain process, even though it's a process that is is much, much needed in, to, in today's world, um, uh, we do also have the option of, of, of getting that farm to table process if, if you'd like. Um, so definitely. And I see local economy, environmental benefits, uh, fresher produce, um, fresh lummy, yummy <laughs> local food, uh, possibly uh, less transportation, which it definitely is less transportation, um, and local support for small sustainable farmers. All great answers. I do appreciate everyone who... Uh, who uh, took some time to uh, answer the questions in the active poll. Thank you. And the uh, cons, what are some cons to the farm to table process? And uh, some of the cons that we have, we can see here on the screen, seasonal changes, greenwashing, expensive for restaurants. Uh, I also think that farmers need more awareness of good AG practices and good uh, handling practices to ensure quality products, absolutely. Uh, often a lot more expensive. Not everyone can afford it. Uh, more expensive. Yes, it is. Uh, going farm to table is definitely more expensive. We could see that uh, when we go to the grocery store and we go to the organic section. Why is it that the organic foods cost more than uh, foods that are non-organic? Um, and it's because of, you know, uh, that farm to table process. Those foods also do expire uh, a lot sooner than your um than your uh, non-organic products. Uh, as a restaurant owner, you need to customize your menu as food changes, and in order to uh, for these farms to compete with industrial farms, they will have significantly higher prices. Expansive uh, endeavor, ever-changing menu. Uh, liars have taken advantage of the trend, trick consumers into thinking they're eating farm to fork. That is uh, very true. Um, there are articles out there about that uh, where there are restaurants that have been caught lying to their customers and saying that they do uh, uh, afford them the farm to table process, but that was not the case. Uh, so you definitely want to check in and, and ask uh, any of the management uh, at your local, if you're interested in this, at your local grocery stores. Um, hey, you know, what what uh, farms are you sourcing your your your, your local produce out of? And uh, they should be able to tell you. And uh, from there, you can do your own investigating and find out whether or not uh, those farms exist or even uh, if, if they are, in fact, the farm that is providing uh, the local produce over to your, your grocery store. Um, and then we've got, uh, we've keep, it keeps coming up really pricey. Um, and you're going to spend a lot of money on food, constantly changing your menu. That's another big thing uh, as far as a con in the farm to table process with restaurants. Very difficult to scale. Um, and food may have a shorter shelf life. Uh, hasn't been processed for preservation. Premium pricing drives inequality in access. And, uh, and th that is po uh, a major portion of it is that your food may have a shorter shelf life, um, especially if your refrigeration processes, as far as the uh, 
uh, equipment that you need to store these things are not um, up to par. They haven't been maintained or you just don't have those types of uh, applications at your site, which we'll get into. We'll talk about uh, food displays and food storage, uh, the types that are used in commercial applications and such. Once again, I want to thank everyone who took the time uh, for the active poll. Um, do appreciate it. Makes our class uh, a little bit more interactive. Um, so thank you there once more. All great answers, by the way. Um, so really quick, quick brief review before we uh, take a quick break here. Um, we went through uh, the first uh, portion, which was talking about the history and also um, we spoke a little bit to the cold chain and farm chain, uh, cold chain and, and farm to table process. Um, uh, we we touched on um, we touched on co uh, uh, consolidation and packaging distribution, uh, harvesting from the farm, everything that uh, is required within the cold chain process. And then we spoke a bit into farm uh, to table process, where that's a bit quicker. Um, but we do have some some cons with that as far as pricing and availability and and different different subjects when it comes to uh, the end user uh, that requires that that uh, that farm to table process for their produce. Um, so this uh, this ends the first portion. We'll go ahead and we'll take a uh, we'll take a break. I think it's safe to say uh, we've been running for about an hour and 14 now. So let's let's take a, a little bit of a longer break here. Let's take a let's take a, a 10 minute break. Uh, go ahead and get some coffee, stretch your legs. Um, this next half that we're jumping into is a it goes a little bit deeper. We talk to uh, some of the uh, uh, industries and also the equipment that you'll find, the commercial equipment that you'll find uh, in the refrigeration applications. Um, that are out there currently. So let's take a break and we'll come back here 10 uh, minutes after the hour uh, to uh, resume our presentation on commercial refrigeration.
got about another minute on our break. Hopefully everyone's coming back uh, a little bit more refreshed. Now, as we get ready to dive into uh, the last half hour of our course today, I'm going to stop approximately uh, uh, 10 minutes short to the hour. Uh, so that way, uh, any messages or announcements that need to be made can be done so. Um, and then we will continue on to day two on Thursday, same place, same time, uh, for the second portion of commercial refrigeration. All right, hopefully everyone's back uh, and we're uh, got a good break ready to get on to the uh, next half of this. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started at refrigeration industries and commercial equipment. We're going to start touching on some of the different industries that uh, you'll find refrigeration applications in. And then we'll specifically talk to commercial uh, refrigeration equipment. Uh, in the uh, commercial kitchen, restaurant, uh, supermarket uh, arena, uh, and we'll have some uh, some pictures and uh, 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 different um, images showing some of these uh, different storage devices um, and also refrigeration uh, equipment. So let's uh, let's get started by jumping into some of the modern refrigeration industries. And before I jump into uh, this topic here, I just want to check in, Diane, and make sure we don't have any questions in the uh, chat available currently. No, we just had somebody let us know that they'll be they had to run to another meeting. Okay, okay, no no problem at all. Thank you, Diane. All right, so modern refrigeration uh, industries. So before we jump into that, we wanna just get really clear um, the differences between some of these different uh, uh, air condition, not air condition, but refrigeration application slash processes, right? So uh, we'll start uh, from left to right and and, uh, define some of these different apps and processes and we'll start with air conditioning when we talk in specific regards to refrigeration and air conditioning is defined as a system or process for controlling the temperature humidity and sometimes the purity of the air by filtration uh, in an interior uh, uh, location such as an office a theater uh, a laboratory or even your house um, which we all use air conditioning at home for a lot of us in most of the, uh, the nation. And then we have refrigeration, uh, which is the topic of our discussion mainly today. Um, and, and this is defined as the removal of unwanted heat from a selected object substance or space, and it's transferred to another object substance or space. And the removal of heat lowers the temperature and may be accomplished by the use of ice, snow, chilled water, or some sort of mechanical refrigeration. And then lastly, we have what's known as process cooling. And this is defined as the removal of unwanted heat from a direct process. So removal of the unwanted heat is often necessary to ensure the process continues in a safe, efficient, consistent, and reliable manner. For example, the generation of power or electricity uh, requires process cooling. And we'll touch a little bit on that uh, maybe on day two of our course. We define these to understand the different uses of refrigerant vapor compression cycle and its application in the different industries for a vast community of consumers. 
So within the industry, you have several different types of uh, uh, refrigeration. And uh, three of those different types of refrigeration are listed here. Well, we have commercial refrigeration, industrial refrigeration, and also consumer refrigeration. So let's touch on each one of those uh, just to get a further definition as to what uh, processes or applications those types of uh, refrigeration are responsible for. So when we talk to modern commercial refrigeration, uh, what is that? What is modern commercial refrigeration systems? And commercial refrigeration, when you speak to that, it refers to the cold storage equipment used in specifically commercial settings. So any of these uh, industries that you see here on your screen, your supermarkets, your specialty food stores, convenience stores, grocery stores, restaurants, these are all the different commercial settings uh, where cold storage is required um, to maintain the business. Um, now, modern commercial refrigeration is applied to many industries from cold chain transportation of food and pharmaceuticals to the cryogenic processes, which, uh, in, which are involved in industrial applications, such as metal forging. Uh, refrigerated trucking is also a part of the commercial refrigeration process. So when we looked at the cold chain process, we saw that our bell pepper uh, had to make its way to each destination uh, via some sort of uh, refrigerated um, uh, semi-trailer. Um, and these uh, uh, refrigerated transportation uh, vehicles are very uh, they're, they're they're instrumental in in this entire cold chain process. We we probably couldn't do the cold chain process if we hadn't had the technological advancements where we're able to uh, cool a 50 foot container being uh, um, being hauled by uh, a semi truck. Okay. Uh, as discussed uh, earlier, refrigeration began its uh, stages as a CO2 compressor, and now we we come back full circle to the evolution and development of CO2 refrigeration and its use in several other uh, applications, such as commercial heat pump water heater uh, units and systems. So we started off uh, working on the refrigeration cycle with CO2, um, uh, as far as the CO2 uh, compressor, and we have evolved from that over time, uh, especially with the different types of refrigerants we, we have uh, available to us. Some that are now uh, obsolete from uh, our inventory and the new uh, blends of refrigerants that are out there today. Uh, but the, the CO2 that we're referring to, which was the uh, uh, original um, refrigerant for our system, is now being utilized uh, in in systems today, uh, such as commercial heat pump water heaters uh, for uh, the deliver delivery of heat or hot water uh, to specific uh, sites that have those systems installed. Uh, so we're we're continuing to improve the uh, the technology as time goes on, um, but we're also um, we're also placing that that technology in other arenas. To, um, to make it work. And we can see that with the CO2 in commercial heat pump water heating systems. Now, uh, industrial refrigeration um, and w you know what 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 is industrial refrigeration? what why do we need uh, industrial refrigeration? And industrial refrigeration is pretty much defined as the equipment and accessories which are projected to remove heat uh, from large scale processes or materials, lowering the temperature to a desired value. Uh, and the industrial refrigeration is used in many industries such as food processing, uh, chemical, pharmaceutical, and plastic manufacture, manufacturing to construction. Within these industries, water-cooled chillers plays a very important role uh, in uh, that process that requires the cooling of a large amount of water. So when we look at these different industries, we've got uh, IT data centers. Um, I spent the majority of my career working in these, uh, and uh, the refrigeration process as far as using 
uh, chillers um, for um, uh, water-cooled racks, which holds the uh, equipment necessary for IT and data centers. Um, this was this was uh, 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 refrigeration and and the uh, uh, vapor compression cycle as far as what's embedded in these uh, these applications that that provide cooling to these areas to reduce the heat load um, uh, is, is extremely important. Um, and when we think of refrigeration in these different uh, arenas, um, we have to understand that there is equipment that's responsible uh, in each type of arena uh, for each different type of um, uh, application that's, that, that is being uh, uh, serviced or, or used. Uh, and when we look at it, we could take, like for instance, we go to electrical electricity production. Uh, there are several different fuels that are used to create electricity, um, and we'll talk about that shortly. I didn't want to jump into it too fast, but I want to use it as an example. Uh, the purity of the air being drawn in uh, to create the combustion of these different fuels to create electricity needs to be within certain parameters. So one of those parameters is that that air being drawn in to create this combustion cannot be too hot. So that air uh, needs to be cooled down uh, prior to it uh, being utilized for combustion to create any electrical um, uh, energy that we use on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So refrigeration is used in this process in order to cool the environment um, or, the, um, or the medium being used in a certain application. So that way it operates more efficiently. Um, and you can see here some of these different industries that we use the uh, refrigerant in, in, the, in the industrial um, side. Uh, we have ice rinks uh, and also construction, and we see pharmaceuticals up there besides data centers. Data centers and IT is one of the biggest areas in, in, in the industrial uh, area, uh, but we still have others like ice rinks and such. And we'll talk to the ice rink application. I selected that one to go into a little bit more in depth on uh, uh, indirect uh, applications that um, that works for ice rinks. So we'll touch on that here um, uh, a little bit later on in our presentation. And then lastly, uh, consumer refrigeration. Um, when we speak of refrigeration, this is what most of us are used to. Uh, household or domestic refrigeration went through its own evolution as it became safer and more efficient to preserve foods for our own use right at home. Uh, the modern refrigerator that we have today, um, you know, has several uses. Uh, we use it for storage, uh, humidity controls, uh, temperature controls, and also uh, we have the luxury of enjoying a cold beverage on a hot day. Uh, because we have uh, the capabilities of using a refrigerator right there in the home. Uh, so we've come a long way from the early 1900s um, where we had uh, blocks of ice uh, that was harvested from streams, uh, frozen streams um, and lakes uh, where that ice had all kinds of uh, uh, um, matter and foreign matter from the uh, environment. Um, swimming in your drink. Um, so we we have moved on uh, a, a long way technologically. Uh, we've gone a long way uh, from those times. So uh, what we'll do here is we'll stop for a second, see if we have any questions, and then we'll uh, start diving into some of the material that we are going to get into on day two. Um, which is commercial kitchen and retail equipment. Uh, but if we, uh, let me stop here really quickly, check in with Diane. Diane, do we have any uh, any questions thus far? We have a question from Len. It says, are there CO2 refrigerators available for consumers? For consumers, I don't know the answer to that now, uh, as far as refrigerators are concerned. Um, now I do know as far as uh, commercial heat pump water heaters uh, with the CO2 refrigerant, yes, that is available. 
um, but I will have to do some research on the CO2 for, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing the, the question revolves more around residential. And if it is around residential, I'm going to have to get you uh, an answer for that and have it for you on Thursday. I do apologize. Okay. Was that the only question we had there, uh, Diane? That, that, that was it. Okay, awesome. So we'll get back to that question on uh, on Thursday. Just want to get you a more solid answer as far as the residential side of things. Um, I mostly work commercial applications, uh, but on the residential side, I mean, we are in 2022, so there may be something out there. I mean, this technology is con constantly advancing. Um, so let me do a little bit of research and, and get back to you on that question uh, on Thursday. Thank you for the question, by the way. It was a great one. Okay, so if we have no further questions, let's uh, get into commercial kitchen and retail equipment. Um, so uh, we have different types of uh, commercial equipment. When we talk to um, the commercial equipment, especially in the restaurant and, 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 and commercial kitchen area, or uh, um, uh, when we talk to those different, uh, those different um, two different topics, uh, we have several different types of commercial equipment, uh, which are available for food storage and display. And we'll go over some of those items to include food preparation equipment, retail food merchandising, open air cases, commercial food storage, and also air curtains and air doors, which are very important in uh, the uh, commercial refrigeration space uh, when it comes to docks and also uh, areas of a, uh, a grocery store or even a kitchen um, that requires these air curtains and doors so that way you can maintain the humidity and temperature controls of uh, the area where you're housing your, your, your produce or your foods. So here on the screen, we can see uh, a couple examples of some food preparation uh, equipment. And food preparation equipment is, is found primarily in restaurants and cafeterias, uh, but sometimes in shared venues like community centers, concession stands, and uh, gathering areas in places of worship. Now, the temperatures can be set specifically to the type of food being stored. Uh, these refrigeration systems are designed for short-term use as food is bought out from the cold storage to be prepared. So you're, you don't want to leave any of your foods that you are preparing in these uh, these different equipment that we can see here on screen uh, longer than a, you know the designated time for each one of those items. Uh, um, restaurant food preparation equipment, including refrigeration units, are stainless steel for uh, sanitation purposes. Uh, I'm a big advocate for stainless steel. A lot of the uh, um, cooking utensils I use um, are made of stainless steel uh, just because it, it doesn't have anything that can peel off of it, such as uh, Teflon or some of the other uh, materials that are made um, today. Uh, but stainless steel is one of the highest grades uh, uh, you can use uh, in, in equipment for sanitation purposes. And most of these refrigerate, refrigerated prep units are self-described by their name. So everything you see on screen here as far as how it's named is exactly what it's used for. Okay, so let's go from left to right really quickly and touch on some of these different uh, preparation uh, stations. Uh, top left, we have the refrigerated salad prep table, uh, and this is where sandwiches and salad prep tables, uh, this is where sandwiches and salads are, are prepped, um, and it, it, this is a great area for food preparation. Uh, refrigerated uh, prep tables feature pans to store and refrigerate uh, the ingredients that are being utilized. Directly next door, the tabletop refrigerated condiments holder. Uh, refrigerated uh, prep tables are often used in sandwich shops and pizzerias. So if you frequent a pizzeria or some sort of sandwich shop in your area, you may be familiar with seeing this uh, this type of tabletop refrigerated condiment holder. 
um, sometimes you may even see these on the sides of uh, uh, those those uh, those trucks that um, uh, um, I, I forget the name of them, but the, the mobile trucks that uh, offer food services. Uh, they, you may see one of these tabletop refriger refrigerated condiment holders there as well. And then to the right of that, we have the chef's base. Uh, a chef's base will keep ingredients or um, or prepared meals close to your cooking station, uh, making food prep more efficient. It's made to have a cooktop placed on the top of it so that the chef can prepare dishes and have the components close at hand in the drawers beneath. So that is a chef's base. Uh, to the left on the bottom, we have a, ref an, a refrigerated sandwich prep table, and it performs the same as a tabletop condiment holder, which you find these specifically in sandwich shops. And to the right of that, we have the under counter refrigerator, which is for needing a little bit extra storage space. Um, in like for a refrigerator, but you need something that's more closely stationed to your, your different prep stations or simply don't have the room uh, out in the front for a, a traditional style reach and refrigerator, which we'll talk about here uh, in, in, in our course. An under counter model is a great way to add cold storage space. So if you don't have the, uh, uh, the space within your site, maybe you're renting a really small uh, location um, to, to run your restaurant, small business, and you don't have the space for an extremely large walk-in uh, freezer or refrigerator, you can get the under-counter refrigerator, and this will assist you in saving that space and still have the required refriger refrigeration method required for your restaurant. And then directly to the right, we have the refrigerated pizza prep table. Uh, which is uh, exactly what it says, and it's used in pizza shops for pizza preparation. And I think this one here is one of my favorites um, uh, as far as uh, retail food merchandising and, and showing that, uh, uh, displaying th these different products that we have for sale. Uh, in retail food merchandising, it's important to note that uh, each of the pic pictured cases have different temperature and humidity requirements, so they're not all the same. Uh, open top freezer cases rely on convection and stratification to keep the products the right temperature, even though that that top is open. So get over here, see if I can get that. There we go. So this open top uh, display that uh, you can see here, um, it still needs to uh, have the right temperatures, even though you have a fully open top, um, which these are for reaching. Let me grab that. You, what you, some things that you might find in these open top frozen cases are like some of the specials that your grocery store may may have going on, such as a, a two for five on on a ball ballpark links or something like that. Uh, if it's, it's if it's already frozen, you could reach in there and, and just grab that. But those open top cases, they need to maintain certain temperatures and they, they do a great job of that. Uh, seafood cases uh, and displays use two methods of refrigeration. Uh, the temperature is maintained by mechanical refrigeration and the seafood rests on a bed of ice to, main, to help maintain the needed humidity levels within the case. So there are two processes going on in, in the seafood display at once. You have a mechanical process for refrigeration where compressors used, and you also have a, a, an extremely uh, well-situated bed of ice that uh, creates that uh, humidity level, um, which is needed for the seafood uh, to maintain its, its, uh, its look, its taste, its smell, all, all those good things we like about um, these products, uh, we need to be able to have the right settings uh, so that way we can um, uh, uh, preserve them and also put them out for display for, for sale. Uh, so we have two, um, two, two different processes happening in a seafood case. We have a mechanical process and then we have a, another process um, where we have uh, ice which helps maintain humidity levels. And then directly next door to that, we have the reach-in refrigerator, uh, or or and and freezer. Uh, you can all we can we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth. 
but uh, you can you can only have uh, one or the other. Uh, they're, they're not intertwined. The reach and refrigerator pictured here uh, is stocked from the back. So the stocker has to go inside the compartment to stock the shelves. It's pretty cold back there. Um, there are some locations, uh, especially um, places that sell liquor, wine, and beer. Uh, they allow you to go into the cooler um, if you want something much, much colder or um, you just want to grab something from way in the back, which uh, we'll learn as well when we look at evaporators uh, inside of these uh, reach-in freezers and refrigerators, we'll see and learn that uh, the items placed co uh, closest to the evaporator is going to be the coldest, depending upon where that evaporator is inside that system. We have a couple okay. questions, if you're ready. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let me just finish this last two, uh, statements and then we'll take those questions. Um, now we have also, uh, the, the beverage and, uh, mixed use case, uh, uh, re uh, refrigerators that you see down on the bottom left are stocked from the front and they are designed for the doors to remain closed, except for when a customer selects something. Uh, these cases are still referred to as reach-in coolers. And then lastly, we have our pastry case and flower cases, um, which are good examples of the need to maintain precise humidity control as well as temperatures. So we know that with floral display, ca uh, display cases or flowers in general, uh, if we don't have the right temperatures for certain flowers, they will uh, wither away and die. Um, temperature and humidity settings. And this also goes for pastry and confection display cases. Uh, they also need to contain the right humidity levels and uh, temperature levels. So that way your items not only look good to eat uh, or purchase, uh, but they maintain, um, uh, um, they, they, they maintain their look, form, feel, shape, smell, and taste. Uh, now, for those questions, we can we can go through those now. Okay, we have um, from Ian. Do any commercial appliances come with Energy Star ratings or equivalent? Our use is K through 12 kitchens, both storage and preparation. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the commercial sector, yes. It 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 will depend upon um, your use in your commercial kitchen. So it with the energy star or if we want to talk about just energy savings in general um, there are different applications uh, that will allow you to 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 be in that realm so there are systems such as split systems that you can use which we'll get into on day two i think it, it's it's going to get a little bit more interesting on day two uh with some of the systems that we'll talk to directly um, but there are systems that will allow you to save energy by utilizing a system similar to a chiller system. For those of us that are experienced with chillers or have a, have an understanding of chillers, uh, what these systems do is they literally locate uh, uh, one of the units outside and one of the units inside. And the, the unit that's inside is supplying uh, the medium, whatever we're using, uh, to cool these these different cases, um, it's supplying those different cases with different temperatures. So we'll we'll get a little bit more into that. And what that does is it eliminates um, these unitary systems where everything is all in one, and you have several compressors uh, turning on and running and cutting off and just not being as efficient as we need it. So tomorrow we'll touch on a bit more of those different applications so you can see uh, what makes sense for your uh, your site um, and, and your kitchen or, or wherever you require these uh, refrigeration applications. Okay, and Lisa has two questions. Now with COVID, how often does the equipment need to be cleaned? And does the equipment need to be plugged in and drawing electricity 24-7? Uh, on both, okay, let's start with the, the first question. Um, with COVID uh, right now, I think uh, um, the maintenance levels have have changed. Uh, they, I think right now with everything that's going on, uh, and I've seen it in a lot of places that I've been, 
they're they're running maintenance more than often, um, which is good. Uh, you want to do that. Uh, a lot of sites that I've been to, maintenance is something that is often neglected. Um, but I've seen during the, the pandemic that it has actually increased in a lot of areas, um, and I'm very happy to see that. Um, but what that tells me is that uh, maintenance is actually being done now um, in a lot more places than you would normally see uh, in the past prior uh, to COVID hitting. And then the second question, uh, as far as being plugged in all the time, We'll get into that more when we get when we start talking about controls, um, because what the control system will do with an energy efficient system is that it will uh, you, it will allow you to keep equipment plugged in 24 seven for operation. Uh, but what it will do is it will cycle that equipment and it will also monitor it for any um, changes that need to be made. So we'll talk about that more in depth when we go over BAS and EMS systems when dealing with refrigeration uh, uh, applications and processes. Okay, we have one more question from Len. Open top refrigerator frozen food cases are convenient, but use significantly more energy than closed cases. Are open top food cases being replaced by closed food cases? That question I am not 100% sure on, and I could definitely take a, uh, a further look into for you. Um, I do find that these open top food cases are still utilized a lot of places, and they do generally uh, they do generally absorb a lot of or utilize a lot of energy. Um, but I think what's happening in the industry is they they've noticed that. And they, they may be making uh, upgrades to the compressor that's utilized in these applications to maybe run a VFD in order to more precisely control uh, the motor's operation so that way we can reduce the energy usage of that application. Um, but let me dig in a bit deeper uh, on that question for the open top uh, frozen food cases as well. Okay, that's all for questions. All right. Uh, okay, so it is five till the hour. I I believe uh, there are some announcements that need to be made before we close out today. So I am going to uh, say goodbye for now, and uh, I will see all of you back here uh, on Thursday uh, for the second part of our our course uh, on commercial refrigeration. I do want to thank all of you today for your participation. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you for day two. Lester and Diane, thank you very much, uh, especially for setting the deep dive that will circle back and uh, tie everything together on Thursday. So uh, for folks that are here, uh, remember upcoming uh, classes. Uh, Lester will be back with us on Thursday. Uh, for the second half of commercial uh, refrigeration, and then tying in in part with the discussion that we that Lester just had with respect to uh, variable frequency drives and, and control systems, uh, on June 21st and 23rd, Lester will be back with us discussing adjustable speed var uh, variable frequency drives. And then, of course, on the 14th of July, we will be back with a light fair recap. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and email me. Here's my email address or give me a call. Again, a reminder that today's slide deck will be posted uh, as well as the recording to our webpage. Uh, final reminder, we are Lighting Design Lab, uh, a part of Seattle City Light. And please don't forget to take the online survey once you exit the webinar. So Andrew, uh, Andrew Lester and Diane, uh, thank you very much once again for a uh, wonderful presentation this morning. And we will look forward to seeing all of you again on Thursday. Uh, one last uh, opportunity, if anybody has any questions, we can leave it open for just another minute or two. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Going once. Going twice. All right, fair enough. Uh, once again, uh, everybody, thanks for uh, a great morning, Lester and Diane, and uh, we will see you all on Thursday. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>